Thank you, Irina, and greetings, everybody. It's good to be with you again here this year for this conference. <coughs> so my topic <coughs> is repentance and forgiveness as it's um, spoken about by the church fathers and before them by scripture. And as one might expect, and as we're going to see, there are many layers or dimensions to this topic. Some of the most immediate questions that might be important for us might be things such as, how do we receive forgiveness of sins? And how can we learn to forgive others? We all know the petition of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, which as St. Maximus Confessor points out, makes us an example for God. We invite him, the one who cannot be imitated, to imitate us. There's also the injunction in Scripture that we should forgive those who sin against us, not seven times, but 70 times seven, which, as St. John Chrysostom, as most of the fathers who commented on this passage, they say this does not signify a particular number, but that which is infinite, perpetual, and forever. However, if we're going to get to the heart of the mystery, we need to consider such scriptural statements in context to examine some of the many aspects and dimensions of forgiveness. For example, the context of the injunction to forgive 70 times seven makes it clear, as St. John Chrysostom points out, that it is only referring to the one who's repentant. With regard, he says, with regard to the other, the one who does not repent, nor acknowledges his own faults. Christ sets a limit to your forgiveness by saying, let him be to you as the heathen and the publican. Similarly, when we ask God to imitate our forgiveness of our neighbor, it is also in the context of beseeching God him, that he will himself forgive us. In the context that is, of our own repentance towards God. So repentance, as we will see, in fact constitutes both the entrance to our own forgiveness and the position in which we can learn to forgive others. So I'll return to repentance in a minute. But first and most importantly, beyond the immediate context of each statement, lies the fact which is perhaps so obvious that we're blind to its immense significance. The fact that all of these injunctions are given in the New Testament. That is, they are made in the context of the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the one who through his crucifixion and resurrection has himself become our peace and reconciliation with God the Father. So it's only in the context of the revelation of God through Christ that we come to know ourselves as sinful. And more specifically, it is in the revelation of God in Christ that we come to forgiveness and reconciliation with God. So according to the Old Testament, no one can forgive sins but God alone. So when Christ forgave the paralytic man his sins and thereby healed him, he was accused of blasphemy in Mark chapter 2. But in reverse, this also means that in this very action of forgiving, Jesus Christ was revealed as a son of God, even if this was only known later. So the whole theme is placed in the context of the crucifixion, as already made clear in the second century by St. Irenaeus of Lyon. He writes on this passage, he says, Therefore, by forgiving sins, he did indeed heal the man, while he also revealed himself openly who he was. For if no one can forgive sins but God alone, yet the Lord forgave them and healed the man, it is plain that he was himself the word of God become son of man, receiving from the Father the power of the forgiveness of sins, since he was man and since he was God so that as man he might suffer with us, and as God have mercy upon us and forgive us our debts, by which we were made debtors to God our Creator. And therefore David says beforehand, 
Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord has not imputed sin. Pointing out beforehand the forgiveness of sins effected by the coming of the Lord, which is destroyed by the handwriting of our debt and fastened it to the cross, so that as by means of a tree we were made debtors to God, so also by means of a tree we may obtain forgiveness of our debt. So our forgiveness and our reconciliation with God is affected through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and this is the good news, the proclamation of the gospel. But this brings us back to repentance. For repentance belongs to the very heart of the gospel proclamation. Repentance is not simply that to which our minds should turn as we're about to enter Great Lent. Indeed, both John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ himself begin their preaching with the same words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is through repentance that we learn to accept the good news. Without repentance, there's neither forgiveness, salvation, and no entry into the kingdom. Clearly, then, repentance is important. Important. However, because of the many and various associations we bring to our understanding of the term, we often miss its true significance. So let's start. What is repentance? We have probably all heard that the word repentance, metanea, means conversion, literally a change of mind. That is, it's not simply a regret for the past, a sorrow for sin, a feeling of grief or a feeling of guilt, but it is a reorientation, a change in perspective, redirecting our sight towards God, recentering our lives in Him. To repent, then, is not to look downwards or to look backwards with self-reproach and despair for one's own failure. Repentance is to look and to strive forwards, eagerly desiring that which, by the grace of God, we're called to become. But to orient ourselves correctly, forward, upward, it's necessary to begin again from Scripture, from the Word of God addressed to us, rather than with our own ideas about what we think our shortcomings are, which would always be determined by a standard other than the Word of God. So in Matthew, immediately before Jesus begins to preach, we are told that John had been arrested, the Baptist, the Baptist had been arrested, and that Jesus has, had left Nazareth to go to Capernaum in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And he does this so that the words of Isaiah might be fulfilled, a prophecy which is cited by Matthew and fulfilled in Christ. Isaiah chapter 9. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali towards the sea across the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, on them light has dawned. So it's with that quotation, from that moment on, that Jesus begins to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Christ's preaching of repentance follows on the proclamation that the prophecy has been fulfilled. Those in darkness have been enlightened. And Christ's message of repentance is given form by this proclamation. Repentance is a transition. It's a Passover from darkness to light. Not to remain guilt-ridden in the darkness of self-pity, but to repent, to convert, to open one's eyes to the light of the good news. Moreover, the fulfillment of the prophecies in, Christ's, in Christ leads through repentance to the advent of the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand if you but repent. So repentance is also eschatological. It's our conversion to the kingdom, the reign of love, which Christ has begun or inaugurated. So in Matthew, this statement 
Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's followed by Christ healing the sick, the Sermon on the Mount, in which Christ tells us to be as he himself is. I say to you, he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you, so that you may indeed be sons of the Father in heaven. So it's only then in this context of forgiveness that we are able truly and continually to forgive those who sin against us, to be as perfect as our Father in heaven. So in this way, the proclamation of Scripture, the Word of God, both as prophecy and fulfillment, gives repentance its content and significance. Only in the light of Christ, this is a key point, only in the light of Christ can we see the sinful, inadequate state of our life apart from Christ. As Bishop Theophan, St. Theophan the Recluse put it, as long as a room is in darkness, you will never see the dirt. But when some light enters into the room, then you begin to notice the dirt. And the stronger the light, the smaller are the specks of dust that you begin to see. So it is with ourselves. We must be addressed by the word of God. We must allow ourselves to be addressed by his word before we can begin to understand our sinfulness and thereafter repent. That relationship is shown in Isaiah's reaction to the vision of the Lord in the temple that was granted to him. Isaiah sees the Lord sitting upon the throne and the seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy. And you would think that to see the Lord sitting upon the throne with all the angels surrounding him is something to rejoice at, but Isaiah's reaction is to cry out, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. To see the Lord produces this reaction of repentance and conversion. Emphasizing the inverse nature of this relationship, one of the desert fathers, Abba Matoes, commenting on Isaiah's words, he says, the nearer a man draws near to God, the more he sees himself a sinner. So repentance begins with a sense of the splendor of God, not of our own wretchedness. A perception of our own squalor, not seen through the prism of the glory of God, conveyed by Christ, would only lead into deadly despondency. Now such repentance is clearly not a one-time act or a preliminary stage. This repentance really is, as it were, the mode of being of a Christian, an ever-increasing humility. The fathers of the church, especially the desert fathers and the ascetic writers, remind us of this forcefully. For instance, while Abba Sisseries lay on his deathbed with his face shining like the sun, his disciples saw him talking to someone. When they asked him about this, he said, Look, the angels have come to take me away, and I'm asking for a little more time that I may repent. The disciples said to him, you've got no need to repent. And he answered, truly, I do not think that I have even begun to repent. At which point the disciples knew he was perfect. Similarly, St. John Climacus asserts of compunction and contrition, the attitude of a repentant person. He says that when we die, we will not be criticized for having failed to work miracles. We will not be accused of having failed to be theologians or contemplatives. But we will certainly have to give some explanation to God for not having been continually contrite. This continual contrition, continual repentance. Bringing together some of these themes, St. Basil the Great says, God 
by sending down his only begotten son for the remission of sins, has already forgiven sins, so far as his part's concerned. But since the holy David sings of mercy and judgment and testifies that God is merciful and just, it is necessary that, the pro- that what the prophets and the apostles say in their passages about repentance should be done by us so that the judgments of God's righteousness should be manifest and his mercy perfected unto the forgiveness of sins. So his point is that we must embrace the repentance spoken of by Scripture, the prophets in the Old Testament, the apostles in the New, in order that God's righteousness may be revealed, his mercy concretely realized in the forgiveness of sins, that is, in us. As Basil puts it, God has already forgiven us in and through his Son, but we need to accept that forgiveness through repentance. Now, it might seem strange to say that an aspect of repentance is that it enables us to receive forgiveness. It's not that God's decision to forgive depends upon our contrition, but rather that unless we actually perceive the distance which separates us from God, the sinfulness and nothingness of our life without God, despite him or in spite of him, we will not be able to receive the forgiveness he offers, for we will not, we will not be convinced that we actually need it or even need God himself. We'll be like the Pharisee in the, in the parable, or perhaps even worse. For judged by his own standards, the Pharisee was not a sinner. He kept the law, he observed all his obligations, he attended the temple, yet clearly the Pharisee had no need of God. He was self-confident, self-sufficient. In contrast, the publican was a true sinner and one who knew it. He knew that he had no grounds for any confidence before God, but simply asks God for his mercy. So it's in this way that St. Isaac the Syrian can say very dramatically, he who perceives his own sins is greater than he who raises the dead by his prayer. To perceive one's own sins is also to acknowledge them, to recognize oneself for what one is. Now, this recognition can only cause sorrow. But according to the same father, Isaac, there is nothing more powerful than such sorrow. Let's be clear. He's not talking about the deadly vice of despondency, a despair without confidence in God, but rather the godly sorrow of which the Apostle Paul speaks, a godly grief which produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, unlike the worldly sorrow which produces death. This godly sorrow is a sorrow in which we no longer trust in anything, either ourselves, our supposed virtues and our strength, our words, or in anyone else or in any institution, when we no longer have any confidence in anything apart from Christ himself. It is, as we have seen, only in the revelation of Christ that we can even come to perceive our sins and our sinful state. Yet at the same time, he's our peace and reconciliation with God. And so his manifestation, the light shining in darkness, is also the bestowal of forgiveness. So really, in this state, it is either Christ or nothing. So the correlate of the necessity of recognizing ourselves as sinful is the ability to accept forgiveness. No matter how sorrowful we may be about our being, our life, our actions, unless we are able to accept forgiveness from God, whose word has highlighted 
our sinful state, the light shining in darkness, unless we're able to accept forgiveness, we have not even begun to repent. The two go together. St. John Climacus pushes the comparison further than Isaac. He says, not only is the one who perceives their own sins in such repentance greater than the one who raises the dead, but Climacus describes this as actually being the resurrection itself. If we persevere in this attitude as long as we live, he says, Christ, the divine Son of God, will enlighten you in the resurrection of true repentance. The resurrection of true repentance. It's important to emphasize that repentance is a gift from God. Chrysostom exhorts us with these words. He says, let us apply ourselves to the saving remedy of repentance, or rather, let us accept from God himself the repentance that heals us. For it is not we who offer it to him, but he who bestows it upon us. Repentance is the medicine restoring us to health and salvation, which is supplied by God himself through his Son. Likewise, Clement of Rome at the end of the first century connects this gift of repentance with the crucifixion. St. Clement says, let us fix our gaze on the blood of Christ. Let us know that it's precious to the Father because it was poured out for our salvation and brought the grace of repentance to all the world the grace of repentance, so that those who then receive the grace and repent receive forgiveness of sins and gain salvation. Likewise, at the same time, the letter of Barnabas, he speaks of this gift of repentance, not only the forgiveness of sins, but the gift of repentance, which is our renewal and our recreation as a temple of God. Now, there's one further aspect of the dynamics of repentance and forgiveness which I'd like to draw attention to. St. John Climacus, in his ladder, speaks about how he visited a place called the prison for fallen monks, which stood next to the monastery he was visiting. And he said to the abbot, who confirmed his impression, St. John Climacus said, it seems to me that those who have fallen and are repentant, are more blessed than those who have never fallen and who do not have to mourn over themselves because though having fallen, they have risen by a sure resurrection. It seems a paradoxical claim that those who have fallen and rise again through the grace of repentance are more blessed than those who have never fallen to begin with. This claim echoes a maxim which is found throughout the Desert Fathers, that the true monk is not one who doesn't fall, but one who, when falling, rises again through repentance. This continual striving after virtue, falling, rising, learning repentance. St. Irenaeus, already in the second century, gives an explanation of why this is so when he comments on the prophet Jonah. According to Irenaeus, the human race was created to live by communion with God. But deceived by the serpent who promised them their own immortality, the human race turned away from God in apostasy. But as God is their only true source of life, humans then became subject to death. They gained death, not life. Nevertheless, Irenaeus points out, just as Jonah was swallowed up by the great whale, not to dispose of him, but so that he might learn the true attitude to take with respect to God, the true attitude of thanksgiving and obedience, loving obedience. So also, Irenaeus says, the human race was engulfed from the beginning in the great whale, the great whale of, of death. And we are um, engulfed from the beginning, similarly for educational purposes. The divine pedagogy, the divine economy, 
which begins with creation and culminates in the resurrection. All this was borne patiently by God, who foresaw that the human race would receive an unhoped-for salvation accomplished by his son through the sign of Jonah. So the aim of the whole economy from creation to the resurrection, from creation to new creation, from Adam to Christ, the whole aim of this economy is a pedagogy, acquainting us with our own weakness, but also at the same time allowing us to come to know the strength and graciousness of God. So having gone through all of that, Irenaeus then concludes, he says, such was the patience of God that human beings passing through all things and acquiring the knowledge of death, death is part of the economy, it's a pedagogical tool to teach us that we are nothing without God. So passing through all things and acquiring the knowledge of God, then attaining to the resurrection from the dead and learning by experience whence they have been delivered, may thus always give thanks to the Lord, having received from him the gift of incorruptibility, and may love him the more, for he to whom more is forgiven loves more. And then they may know how mortal and weak they are, but also understand that God is so immortal and powerful as to bestow immortality upon the mortal and eternity upon the temporal. So he says, God was patient while human beings through their ungrateful apostasy learn by experience of their own weakness and mortality without God. Something we know but don't actually believe until we're finally dead. God knowing that having passed through this experience and having this unhoped for salvation bestowed upon them, they would then remain ever more thankful to God, willing to accept from him life and existence which he alone can give. For he to whom more is forgiven loves more. Now what's particularly important about this phenomena spoken of by both John Climacus and by Irenaeus is that whilst our sinful being and life apart from God is precisely that, sin and apostasy, that from which we are converted in repentance, it is nevertheless not simply a mistaken detour whose value lies in being rejected, unacknowledged, unaccepted, left behind. Rather, as I try to emphasize, we need to acknowledge the reality of our sinful state because only then can we learn from our sin and our apostasy. Through experiencing our total weakness without God, most concretely in our actual death, the consequence of sin, we then learn to repent equally absolutely in the resurrection of true repentance spoken of by John Climacus and being forgiven to such an infinite extent that we might also come to love God without measure. So it's in this sense that Irenaeus understands Paul's startling statement in Romans 11, 20, 32. Paul in Romans 11 says, God has consigned all human beings to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. He consigns all to disobedience with a purpose that he may have mercy on all. And likewise in Galatians 3.22, scripture, he says, consigned all things to sin that what was promised to faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Scripture this time consigned all things to sin. I stress the importance of Scripture throughout my talk this morning, the Word of God addressed to us as that which gives form to our repentance. Alongside this, moreover, is the fact that just as a proclamation of the good news begins with a preaching of repentance, Scripture itself, when read or heard as a Word of God, is an important catalyst in actually bringing about this repentance. 
And there are various sayings from the Desert Fathers that illustrate this. For example, there's a saying of Abba Paul the Simple, describing the effects of repentance and conversion and how the word of God actually brings this about in the, in the narrative. The story begins by describing how Abba Paul had a special gift. It says, he had received the grace of, from the Lord Jesus Christ of seeing the state of people's souls, just as we see their faces. One day, it carries on, while observing the brethren going into the church for the synaxis, he noticed that one of them was blackened inside and dominated by demons. At this sight, Paul, it says, beat his breast and sat down in front of the church, whipping, weeping bitterly over him whom he had seen. When everyone came out after the synaxis, he saw that the brother who had previously been dark and gloomy now had a shining face and a radiant body. At this, Paul leapt for joy, blessed God, and asked the brother to tell him what had happened. Then before all the brethren, the brother said this. He says, I am a sinful man. I have lived in fornication for a long time, right up to the present moment. Then when I went into the holy church of God, I heard the prophet Isaiah being read, or rather, God speaking through him. Wash yourself, make yourself clean, take away the evil from your heart, learn to do good, even though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white like snow. And I, he says, the fornicator, am filled with compunction in my heart because of the word of the prophet. And I groan within myself, saying to God, God, you who came into the world to save sinners, that which you now proclaim by the mouth of your prophet, fulfill in me who am a sinner and an unworthy man. Master, from this time forward, receive me as I repent and throw myself at your feet. So it was in hearing the scripture, the word of God being read, which affected the conversion and gave the man access to a new life. More precisely, this was the result, as the passage emphasized, not simply of hearing the words contained in scripture, but hearing God speaking through the prophet. Hearing the scripture as a word of God addressed to him, the man was filled with compunction in his heart, and this was a direct result of the word of God working in him. And then finally, the man beseeches God to complete the transformation spoken of by Isaiah, which had begun through the hearing of scripture. There's one other example I'll mention. It's a story told about Abba Serapion and a prostitute. According to this story, Serapion, as he was passing through a village, noticed a prostitute. And he said to her, expect me this evening, for I should like to come and spend the night with you. When Serapion came back in the evening, after being told that the bed was ready, he asked her to wait with him for a moment while he fulfilled his rule of prayer. He then took out the book of Psalms, and at each Psalm he said a prayer for the prostitute, begging God that she might repent and be saved, and God heard him. The woman stood trembling and praying beside the old man. When he had completed the whole Psalter, the woman fell to the ground. The old man then began reading the epistles and read a great deal from the apostle and completed his prayers. The woman at this point was so filled with repentance and understood that he had not come to see her to commit sin, but to save her soul. So here again, it's the scriptural texts which affect the conversion. Serapion doesn't address any words directly to her. He doesn't stand there exhorting her or, or reproaching her or whatever else it might be. He reads the Psalter and he reads Paul. The scriptural texts affect the conversion. Um, by reading the Psalter, by reading the epistles, he enables the word of God to pierce the woman's heart and initiate the process of repentance and transformation. So without being initiated in this way by scripture, the word of God addressed to us, and without also being shaped and informed by scripture, as I suggested earlier, our attempts at repentance would be narcissistic, 
and would end in soul-destroying despondency. Repentance is not a matter of gloom and despair and despondency. In the words of St. John Climacus, repentance is the daughter of hope and the denial of despondency. It's born of hope because it comes from the address of God himself, not from our feelings about ourselves. It comes from the address of God himself and therefore is this light shining in darkness full of hope. And it conquers despondency because the word of God is creative, overcoming all the dead ends in which we find ourselves without God. Now, much of what I've spoken about this morning is concretely made manifest at this time of year as we're about to enter Great Lent. And some of us already have. There are two particular points I'd like to indicate. Firstly, Lent itself occurs not in the autumn, the season when everything is beginning to decay and the days draw shorter, nor does it occur in the winter when the earth is frozen and dead and sunlight reduced to a minimum, but rather Lent occurs in the spring as the weather begins to warm, the days grow longer, and everything returns to life. The parallel between the natural season and the dynamics of repentance are made really explicit in the liturgical hymns. So, for instance, in the Vespers for Wednesday before Lent begins, it says, The springtime of the fast has dawned. The flower of repentance has begun. O brethren, let us cleanse ourselves from all impurity and sing to the giver of light, glory to thee who alone lovest mankind. So repentance is a budding flower in the springtime of the fast, the period in which we gradually prepare ourselves to be enlightened by the resurrection of Christ. This springtime begins with the rite of mutual forgiveness and it culminates in the illumination and forgiveness of the resurrection. And this forgiveness really is the fruit of the resurrection. We tend to think of the resurrection as being the result itself. No, the fruit of the resurrection is forgiveness. As we will sing in 40 days' time or more, this is the day of resurrection. Let us shine with the light of the feast. Let us embrace each other and let us say, even to those who hate us, let us forgive all in the resurrection. And so cry, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death to those in the tombs be giving life. Let us cry even to those who hate us. Let us forgive all in the resurrection. The fruit of the, 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 the flower of repentance is prepared through Lent and then blossoms into this um, flower of forgiveness in and through the resurrection. So the season of Lent and the feast of the resurrection bring together the matrix of interrelated themes I've been speaking about this morning. The relationship between forgiveness and repentance. The relationship between repentance and the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God through the cross and the resurrection. And our entry into that through repentance and forgiveness. But we're only just about to begin Great Lent. The second point I would mention to finish off with shows tangibly a point I really have tried to emphasize throughout this talk. And that is the importance of scripture in initiating, shaping, and informing our repentance. So the church services during the days of Lent in the, in the weeks to come are characterized by the, the substantial increase in the reading of scripture. The whole book of Psalms should be read twice each week. No doubt Abba Serapion would have approved. But the most characteristic of this first week in Lent that's coming up next week is, of course, the canon of St. Andrew, read again in its entirety in the fifth week. The canon, the great canon of repentance. 
a canon both in the sense of a liturgical composition and a canon also in the sense of a rule or a standard for repentance. So according to, to the Synexarian for the day, Andrew, having collected and assembled the whole history of the Old and New Testament, composed a present poem, beginning with Adam, continuing up to the ascension of Christ and the preaching of the apostles. The history as recorded in scripture from Adam to Christ, the first Adam and the last Adam, defines the truth of all history, both in its content and its goal. So the canon is a continuous reflection on the repentance to which history calls us. The first eight odes of the canon are a meditation and examples drawn from the Old Testament, expounded in the light of Christ, his cross and resurrection. Indirectly through typology, more directly through each verse of the ode, and then becomes more focused in the ninth ode, which um, the, the history then recorded in scripture, the history of the rebellious human person, his repentance and finally salvation in Christ, really is the history of the whole human race. And therefore it's also my history. Not in the sense that I try to relive all these events as an allegory of the states of my own soul, but rather as I've tried to describe it, that my perception of my own sin and my own forgiveness through repentance is affected by the word of God itself through all the examples which Andrew has set before us. So forgiveness, peace and reconciliation with God established by Jesus Christ through his cross and resurrection. Our acceptance of that forgiveness through repentance, our acknowledging the reality of our sinful state, yet not being despondent about it, despondent because we've lost every confidence in everything else and everyone else, because we've lost all of that, our hope and our trust is now only in Christ, the word of God, in whose resurrection and light we've both become aware of our sinfulness and also of our forgiveness. So that from all of this, we can then embrace everyone and say, forgiveness in the resurrection of Christ. From this, as Climacus would say, this joy-creating sorrow of being able to genuinely forgive everyone else in the resurrection of Christ. This really is the multifaceted mystery which the shepherd of Hermas already in the early second century calls the great understanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Father John, for your uh, presentation. And we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and uh, we will bring you a, mi uh, a microphone. All right at the back. <coughs> okay. Oh, stop. That's in case that Miss on the Kaika Luham de Suidon does the Kohatsuni. Shall she repeat? Um, <clears throat> so the question was, what is the shortest way from the feeling of guilt towards repentance? I think the point I would want to make here is that the fundamental thing that we should be doing is in fact not try to to look at ourselves and diagnose ourselves. When we, when we speak of guilt, we're primarily thinking about how I'm reflecting on what I've done or what's been done to me and all those kind of things. Yeah? And then that brings us in, up in us, shame, guilt, reproach, all those kind of things. And then we live in that. And that really is the, the soul-destroying de despondency that Paul and the fathers there have to speak about. Rather than start, what we tend to do is we try and diagnose ourselves. Yeah, we try and figure out what our problem is. 
and then we try and find our solution to what we think our problem is. And when we do that, we then typically tend to approach Christ thinking we know what our problem is and what we need from him. Yeah, that's, that's where the mistake lies. We should really um, turn to him first, yeah, by the reading of scripture, by, stand, by listening to the hymnography in the church, by prayer, by all the disciplines that we have for that. Allow his light to shine on us and allow him to diagnose us. Yeah, and then we actually see what we thought were our problems in a different way. Yeah, and that's where that transition can occur. Okay? Um, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, where sin is, grace abounds. Yeah? Uh, the, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, revealed in and through Christ, is actually experienced in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our being bruised, in our sinfulness, in all the brokenness that we have, when seen in the right way, seen, by, seen in his light. So we've got to let the light shine into us first, and then we can see the truth about our state. If we try and do it on our own terms, we are misdiagnosing ourselves. Does that help? Yeah? Yeah? So it's not a conversion, it's not, it's not a transition from our own guilt to something, to, to try and work from our guilt to a different experience of repentance. It is a transition from looking at ourselves to looking at Christ and then seeing ourselves in his light that brings about a joy, a joyous repentance. Okay. Thank you. Are there more questions? So I'm sure okay. there will be questions uh, during the break. Um, 